Hey, you. Yes, you, watching this video. Do you want to own a piece of scribbler? Only not a lock of hair or blood or flesh or anything else that will get you in trouble with the law? Well, now you can, with t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags and mugs featuring Obab Scribbler at her Teespring store. You know you want to. I shall now stop talking in third person and send you onto the video. Be lovely to each other and enjoy the show. Vinyl knew something was wrong the moment she stepped through the front door. Tavi? The empty hallway threw her voice back at her. Tavi? Are you home? She should have been back from practice hours ago. The clock on the wall read just after 11. Vinyl would have winced had the fur on the scruff of her neck not been raised. The air was wrong. It was too quiet. Plus... All the lights were off. Octavia hated the dark. Whenever she was home, lights blazed even in rooms she wasn't in. Vinyl wasn't sure why she hated the dark so much, but she had never questioned an excuse to snuggle tighter under the covers of their bedroom at night. She eased the door shut behind her. Every instinct told her to be on guard. She was usually very good at ignoring raw instinct, but right now her guts were clenched so tight she could barely breathe. Something was wrong. Both instinct and intellect told her something was very, very wrong here. She was nearly at the kitchen when she smelled it. <gasps> there was no mistaking that coppery tang in the air. She knew it better than the insides of her own lids when she shut her eyes. Blood. <laughs> Vessels strained to pop behind her eyes. Her mind felt for the spell out of habit. The limiters were still in place, just like always. The loop was still intact. Even after all this time, buried under so many layers, she worried about doing something that could give her away. Or worse, do the impossible and break the loop. Right now, however, too much of her was panicking to even think about how she looked. Blood in her house? In her home? How? Why? Whose? Tabby. Alarm washed through her. She kicked the kitchen door open with such force that the handle lodged in the wall and stayed there. Blood scent hit her with the same level of force, lodging in her nose and throat like barbs. Her nostrils flared, her eyes widened, her mouth became a shrinking zero of surprise and horror. She couldn't move. Damn it, she should be moving. Why was she just staring like a deer on a train track as the Canterlot Express barreled towards it? The pony on hind legs by the kitchen counter looked over his shoulder and smiled. It was, in all fairness, a nice smile. A nice smile and a nice face, even. One might even say it was a pretty smile, set as it was against a backdrop of white fur and eyes that crinkled at their corners. This face, those wrinkles seem to say, smiles a lot. It wasn't until you got to those eyes that your opinion of the face changed. Even then, some ponies might not discern the truth. Ponies were not always perceptive when it came to spotting dangers amongst their own kind. They were a race focused outward, looking for hazards from outside their perfect little society. It was probably some throwback to a bygone age when they lived in herds and had never conceived of things like cities, houses or mass-murdering psychopaths. Ponies didn't kill. Ponies didn't hunt their own. Vinyl had always found it a useful trait to various ends of her own. The stallion's raw presence was intoxicating. 
He didn't even need to say anything. He just had to be, and ponies flocked to him. They never saw the pinpricks of cunning deep in those eyes. They didn't recognize the calculation in his every nod and gesture. Mostly, they never got past the smile. Not until it was too late. Vinyl remembered that smile. She remembered it all too well. You're home! His voice was as handsome as the rest of him. A slight accent clung to his words, not enough to be noticeable, but enough to make his speech patterns more formal and attractive to the ear. A true predator did not miss any trick, after all. We were beginning to think you were not coming, my dear. Were you way late at work? Vinyl tried very hard to keep herself steady. Put her down, Voron. Well, there is a nice hello. And after I made such an effort to be civil, too. Put her down now. The stallion shifted his gaze. Oh, but we were having such fun waiting for you to arrive. You always did have such good tastes, my dear. I see that hasn't changed. He grinned. I might have had a little taste. You did keep us waiting for an awfully long time. <laughs> Octavia's eyes were huge with panic. She stared at Vinyl and might have run to her had he not pinned her against the wall beside the counter with all four hooves off the ground. There was blood on her shoulder. It didn't show red, just darkened her gray fur into black tufts where Voron's mouth had been. A dark line traced a path like filigree to her hoof tip. She had bled enough to make spatters on the floor. I know. She stuttered, terror robbing her of her usual confident speech. Run! Vinyl! <laughs> the chuckle that coated her name was like an oil slick. Seriously? All the names in the world you could have gone with, and that was your choice. Voron shook his head. So did you name yourself after the record or the fabric? No, wait, I, I see you have been drawing on yourself. Musical notes? The record, then. Oh, I am disappointed in you, Vanelda. I thought you had more imagination. Don't freak, don't freak, don't freak, don't freak, don't freak! Vinyl's mind tripped over itself as she fought the simultaneous impulses to run, fight, and just stand there. That voice, that damned voice. She had spent too many sleepless hours trying to force it from her memory. And now here it was. Here he was. Here. In her kitchen. In her home. He couldn't be here. She couldn't let him be here. Stupid, stupid, stupid. This is all my fault. I should have guessed. I should have known. Vinyl swallowed back her recriminations. Put her down. You know you don't want her. Don't I? Voron's tone remained playful. It was a thin veneer. No. You want me. Octavia looked between the two of them. She had no idea. She had no friggin' clue. Oh, she had an inkling of how much danger she was in. Her bleeding shoulder and fear stink told Vinyl that much. Yet, she didn't know the rest. She didn't know who Voron was. What Voron was. Or why he was here. Otherwise, she wouldn't be telling Vinyl to run. Or maybe she would. This was Octavia, after all. The kitchen was a mess. She had fought him. She had fought him hard. Somehow that pleased Vinyl. No way would her girl go down without a fight. <laughs> no friggin' way. Except this was Voron. And that was a very, very stupid way to think. If he had allowed Octavia to fight back, it wasn't because she posed an actual threat. 99% of all he did was purely for his own amusement or gain. The remaining 
Vinyl didn't even want to think about that. The word became a purr in Voron's throat. Offering yourself up? Trying to exchange yourself? How noble. (laughs) Octavia squeaked when he pulled her closer. Vinyl's entire spine prickled with panic and anger. He nuzzled into Octavia's throat, inhaling the terrified earth pony's scent like a kitten finding a nice spot to nap. I was wondering whether you'd set up house here with a pet. It was the most palatable option I could think of when I first tracked you down. Do you know what I saw when I first spotted you in this squalid little bit of suburban nightmare? His lip curled, revealing a hint of curvature beneath. Octavia trembled. I saw you carrying groceries, of all things, through the front door. Brown paper bags. Utterly mundane. Utterly not you. But a pet would be acceptable. Tell me she's a pet, Vanelda. Tell me you haven't been as stupid as I suspect you have. Vinyl? What's going on? Vinyl glared as if the strength of her eyes alone was enough to floor him. Put her down. Voron sighed. Oh dear. I had hoped you had not fallen into such triteness as to shack up with a mortal for some subpar romance novel reason. Please do not tell me you love her, Vanelda. That would be too, too cliché, even for you. Vinyl didn't answer. What was she supposed to say? Either confirming or denying the truth would only end badly. The old urge to comply rose inside her. She shifted her gaze, avoiding meeting his eyes directly. Keep it together. That's not you anymore. You don't have to do what he says. Just keep it together. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Voron pulled away from Octavia, shaking his head. And here was I thinking we were going to be reunited amidst declarations that you had finally seen the error of your ways and planned to come back to where you belong. He smiled. There was less warmth in it than a blizzard. To me, I did, after all, think you were gone from this world. I am so... He paused, as if to relish the word. Happy. To find I was mistaken. Uh, Vinyl? Octavia's cheeks were wet. She wasn't gulping air the way she did when she was upset, or like when she got so angry she made herself cry with frustration. Terrified tears leaked silently from the corners of her eyes. This vinyl name, I do not like it. Stop calling her that. (gasps) Voron shook her for good measure. Octavia's head joggled like a balloon on a stick. Voron, stop this! Vinyl cursed the desperation that crept into her voice. Why do you not call me Daddy, Vanelda? Anyone would think you do not care for me at all. Vinyl couldn't look away from Octavia. I'm sorry. I'm I'm so, so sorry. I should have told you. I should have been honest, but how could I? How could you have even believed me? And even if by some miracle Octavia had believed the wild and crazy story, what then? She would have left Vinyl. Or if she hadn't, she would never have had peace of mind again. The truth would have stolen something from both of them that they could never get back. The only debatable things were what and how much. Voron glanced back at Vinyl. The sudden movement dragged her attention away from Octavia. The whites of his eyes had darkened to pink. She recognized the sudden burst of anger, thinning the pupils into slits. Her stomach lurched. She took an involuntary step forward, foreleg raised as if she wanted to pull him off. It was the worst thing she could have done. 
I thought so. Voron's mild tone did not match his expression at all. You have fallen for this one. Oh, Vanelda. My poor, poor, dear little Vanelda. Do you not know that this is pure foolishness? Lay with mortals, certainly, but never fool yourself into thinking you love them. <laughs> Pink shadowed into red as he turned his attention back to Octavia, hugging her tight against him like a lover. She has your heart. Octavia's chin rested on his shoulder facing Vinyl. She opened her mouth to speak again. Faster than Vinyl could blink, Voron's elbow jutted back and then forward. <coughs> a solid wet crunch echoed off the kitchen walls. No! The cry ripped from Vinyl as Octavia gasped and sagged. Whoops. I think I just broke hers. He came for her the night of the festival. She was wearing the frock Mother said she had worn at her age. She hadn't inherited Mother's dark fur, but the yellow fabric looked just as good against white. She laughed and pranced about as Mother tried vainly to tie a ribbon in her tail. <laughs> Winter song! Mother laughed. Hold still or you should look like a mess. But the unicorns will be setting off the fireworks soon! Mother! Why must I wear a ribbon at all? You look pretty in ribbons. I look foolish. And foolish. And stupid. Pretty. Mother insisted, pulling her close with magic. It always went like that. Magic was the only way she would keep still long enough to be decorated, no matter how pretty the dress, nor silky the ribbon. Mother! <gasps> the cottage door smashed open. Both of them gasped. Instinctively, she hid behind her mother's skirts. They had each dressed up for the festival, and the folds of fabric shielded her completely from whoever was trotting inside. Now what manner of ill-breed equine would... Mother stopped abruptly. You... She said in quite a different tone. Good evening, Spring Blossom. My, my, but you do look quite lovely tonight. Are you going somewhere? No. No, you can't be here. This isn't... How did you find me? A fine greeting after I came all this way and paid you a compliment. This is... This is too soon. She's only a filly. The stranger sighed. <sighs> soon is relative. My arrival is not too early by my estimation. Merely yours. You said her 18th birthday. You promised that you would do nothing until she came of age! And you said you would raise her in luxury. This cottage seems somewhat less than the finery in which I first found you. Did you truly think that you could hide her from me, Spring Blossom? For shame. I... I... I when, when you told me... If I kept your secret, I, I could... You said 18! I have changed my mind. You cannot! I assure you again, my dear, that I most certainly can. You speak as if we are equals who sat down to parley and discussed terms. <laughs> Any terms of our agreement were never yours to define. It suited me, then, for you to take care of the business of raising her while I attended other concerns away from this land. I thought she would have access to high society, would be accepted amongst courtiers and nobles if she grew as one of them. Indeed, I also found it quite amusing that you thought you could blackmail me with my own identity. No doubt you thought relinquishing your family name and fortune would allow you to hide her from me. But you were wrong. I can always find those who have my blood in their veins. Now it suits me to retrieve what is mine. Therefore, 
I have come for her. No! I will not let you! She's just a child! You will not let me? The stranger's voice lilted pleasantly. It sounded nice. Even as he crossed the floorboards in a few quick strides and shoved his face into Mother's, he sounded like he was complimenting the weather or asking politely for directions to the nearest ale house. You are right. She is a child. She is my child. Or did you forget that? Just look at her, Spring Blossom. Look at her and tell me she's not mine. I... I... Please, you have others. You said you had others. And she's so young. Please, leave her. Leave her with me just a little longer. So that you may spirit her away and try to hide again? I think not. At least let her grow up first. You speak as if I mean her ill. This was always the way things were going to be, Spring Blossom. You knew I would come eventually. That I have elected to arrive eleven years before you expected me is neither here nor there. I was always going to come for her. Or did you think that hiding yourself away in this little hovel and getting out of your fine clothes only for festivals would buy you more time? Did you intend to fool me when her eighteenth year came? Did you honestly think you could keep her from me by pretending you were a peasant? You? Nobility shines through even the worst grime, my dear. You are as lovely as the day I chose to woo you. You chose to make me your brood mare. And yet I did not see you cast her off a cliff. Others before you have done as much, or taken themselves off to die when they find themselves bearing my folds and the truth wriggles in their bellies. Some even died trying to rid themselves of their pregnancies. But you... I do not think that even crossed your thoughts. You were always so soft, Spring Blossom. In truth, I am surprised you gave up your wealth so easily to keep her from me. Or me from her. Clearly, you did not mind laying with me so very much, if you were willing to raise my gat and safeguard her like some precious thing, even after you knew the truth. What is her name? Please... Leave us. Let her be normal. What is normal, Spring Blossom? To be your normal is to be weak. I will teach her to be strong. I will make her strong. Strength is her birthright. It doesn't have to be. If you leave her here with me, she could be a normal pony. The stranger clicked his tongue against the roof of his mouth. I tire of this. Fall, what is your name? <coughs> Suddenly, Mother's skirts were gone and she was exposed. She stared up at the stranger. The crash of a finely dressed body against the wall made her tremble. <coughs> Mother! <coughs> the candle lay on its side on the floor, flame guttering. Mother had always told her to never let the flames touch the floorboards. She scrubbed those boards every week and was very proud of them. Now, wax dripped sideways onto the wood, and the candle flame licked greedily at them. Here, little one, murmured the stranger. Look at me. Look into my eyes. No, don't! Winter Song, run! <coughs> Mother coughed as she stumbled to her hooves. Red stained her hairline. <coughs> run! Run away and don't look back! She couldn't move. She was transfixed by the stranger's peculiar eyes. They seemed almost luminous in the flickering glow. The whites darkened to pink as he murmured pleasantly at her. There we are. Good girl. You are a good girl, aren't you? You're my girl. My own sweet girl. Her mouth ran dry. She couldn't even blink as she watched the pink bleed away into dark red. Like some pony had held a glass of red paint in front of the flickering candle. 
The chair Mother had been sitting in slammed into the stranger. He hurtled sideways into the wall and slid down. Encased in sparkling blue magic, the chair rose again and smashed down on him. <coughs> Run now! Run, Winter Song! Mother shrieked at her, horn aglow. As she ran, blinded by frightened, confused tears, she ran out into the darkening evening. Her tiny hooves ate up ground as fast as they were able. When she was halfway down the hill, she realized that following the path might be a stupid idea, and banked left, aiming for the forest tree line. Mother! A scream, abruptly ended, made her stop. It was the first of many mistakes she would make with him. <gasps> he landed in front of her, as if from a great leap, eyes red from lid to lid, save for an incandescent white ring around each slitted pupil. He looked like a demon, risen straight out of Tartarus. She screamed and tried to run again. He had no horn or wings under his cloak. She could outrun him. If she could just get to the village, then maybe she could... <laughs> he overtook her madcap dash and plucked her up in his forehoofs like she weighed nothing. She kicked and fought, but could do nothing more as he brought his face close to hers. Her struggles ceased when he bared his teeth. A pair of pointed fangs gleamed at her. Winter Song, he said, thoughtfully. I do not like that name. It is a weak name for a weak pony who hides behind her mother like a coward. You shall have a new name to begin your new life. What, what did you do to mother? Her voice came out a squeak. You will think no more about her, he said dismissively, as if simply saying it was enough to make it so. That life is over. Your real life begins now. Real... life? The stallion smiled, his white mane fanned around his face, making strange shadows dance across his fur. Vanelda. Yes, I like that name. It means strength where I come from. I am going to teach you how to be strong, Vanelda. It is unfortunate that your sister died so unexpectedly, but things are what they are, and because of her stupidity, you will take her place at my side sooner and learn of your rightful place in this world. He pulled her in close. No! She didn't know what he was going to do, but the whisper of his breath against her throat reignited her struggles. He held her out again and shook her. Do not misbehave! I am your father! You will show me the respect I am due. She froze and stared at him. Her father? Mother had told her father died before she was born. It was why they lived in poverty. Father had not made a will, and mother had lost everything. That was why she spoke so much nicer than the ponies in the village, but still worked for them, cleaning their homes. <laughs> that was the second mistake. She should not have met his gaze. It snagged like a hook into her eyeballs. Something inside her pulled towards him, a writhing, twisting, ethereal snake, slowly uncoiling in its burrow after a long sleep. He pulled her close again. This time she was pliant. Her neck burned. It felt horrible, like the time she stayed out too long in summertime and had heat sickness. She gagged, especially when she heard swallowing close to her ear. Her vision was starting to gray out when he put her down. She couldn't stand, but that didn't seem to matter. Firm hooves turned her face upwards and pulled at her lower jaw. The stallion's voice seemed to come from far away, but his hooves were a vice around her muzzle. No, no daughter of mine will have half strength because she botched her own awakening. 
She continued to cough and choke. Eyes flying open, she couldn't breathe. She could barely think. The snake inside her was made of fire and hot metal. It thrashed and sliced through her organs. Her gourds rose. She tasted bile. Still, he held her mouth shut. The backs of her eyes prickled as she stared up at him, pleading to let her spit out whatever vile thing was shredding her guts. Gradually, the burning flowed outwards, spiraling down her legs and up into her head, lighting every nerve ending ablaze. She was made of fire and flesh and tears that ran and sizzled away in the flames of her own destruction. Her eyeballs were going to explode. His face and all the sky behind it tinted red. I've never had a unicorn daughter before. He purred. Let's see if you're any stronger than the others. And with her guts on fire and her mind in turmoil, she died for the first time. <laughs>